6.08 p.m., August 4, 2020. There's been a large explosion in Lebanon's capital, Beirut, within the last hour. Not only heard it, Adrian, felt it. It shook the Lebanese capital. Some reports are suggesting that it happened at Beirut port. I was kilometers away. The glass broke everywhere around me. Within seconds, so much is destroyed. Beirut's port is in the heart of the capital, along a busy highway and close to densely populated neighborhoods. Without warning, one of the largest non-nuclear blasts in history kills more than 200 people, injures thousands, and leaves hundreds of thousands homeless. Authorities say the blast was caused by highly explosive material stored at a warehouse in the port. That highly explosive material was ammonium nitrate. At the time, authorities promised a transparent investigation. They promised results in five days. But it's been a year, and the lead judge in the case has been facing fierce political backlash as he attempts to prosecute some of those believed to be responsible for unsafely storing the chemical at the port. There are still many questions surrounding the ammonium nitrate and how much of it was inside the warehouse at the time of the blast. The multiple videos that were taken moments before the blast tell part of the story. There was a fire at Warehouse 12. At 5.54 p.m., minutes before the explosion, the fire brigade received a call from the Beirut police. Nine firefighters and a female paramedic immediately responded. The short drive to the port would be their last journey. Their colleagues say they were sent to their almost certain deaths. They weren't told about the dangers, they weren't prepared, and they couldn't protect themselves. Some of the firefighters are seen in this photo trying to force open one of the doors of the burning warehouse because no one at the port had the keys. That was moments before the explosions. There was a smaller one before a larger blast seconds later, believed to have been caused by the stockpile of ammonium nitrate. In the port, the ammonium nitrate was mixed with other materials. Uh, هي, uh, as a fuel, as methanol, as ethanol, هيدول alcohols uh, حتى موجود معه قالوا بالتقرير العسكري كان في مواد مشتعلة هاي المواد المشتعلة بتتبخر يعني uh, بتعمل vapors ال vapors مع الأمونيوم نيتريت هون يبلش الخطر Ammonium nitrate is used as a fertilizer but it's also a component to make bombs the photos that have since emerged showed a disaster in waiting. A cocktail of flammable materials were unsafely stored together. Ammonium nitrate راح يولع النار راح يزيد النار كتير 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 بس ما راح ينفجر. ما راح ينفجر إلا إذا نحنا أعطينا للأمونيوم نيتريت ميكانيكال تريجر. هذا الميكانيكال تريجر اللي نوجد بالبور كان الفايروركس. لما الفايروركس بآخر يعني بآخر كم ثانية من النار بلشوا يولعوا الفايروركس هنا ميكانيكال تريجر 
بيعلوا البريشر اكثر على الامونيوم نيتريت وبيخلوا يصير الانفجار But what started the fire? Investigators who have still to find the answer say it may be hard to find the trigger. The site of Warehouse 12 was pulverized, replaced by a large water-filled crater. The lead judge in the case, Tarek Bitar, has been looking into three possible theories. The first is a mistake in the welding process during repair work that was being done to the warehouse. The second is an intentional fire. Some have suggested there might have been an attempt to hide evidence of theft. And the third theory is that the explosion was caused by a targeted air rocket attack. This was later downplayed following a report by French investigators. In the days and hours before the blast, repair work was being done on Warehouse 12. They were the first of their kind to secure the facility since the ammonium nitrate was confiscated from a Moldovan-flagged cargo ship and stored there in 2014. Lebanon's chief prosecutor, Hassan Awaidet, gave the order after state security warned about possible theft, not the potentially explosive material stored there. This photo purportedly shows the Syrian laborers who were doing the work, but they don't appear to be taking any precautions with the materials inside. Days after the port explosion, they were detained, along with the owner of the contracting company. There's still no proof they had a role in starting the fire and are believed to have left the port an hour before the blast, but they're still being held without charge. Documents have surfaced showing that throughout the years, top officials, politicians, civil servants, military and security officers, knew about the dangerous chemicals and did nothing about it. Naomi Brax, the head of the manifest department at the port, was among those who warned about the potential for a disaster. His wife, Oror, says Nami has documents that show Brax began warning about the ammonium nitrate in 2014 after learning it was being stored in Warehouse 12. In 2014, and in the first the مواد ملتهبة بتشتعل مواد بتشتعل وحفظة يتطلب إنشاءات خاصة غير متوفرة داخل حرم المرفأ يعني عم بقول لهم إنه هول مفروض ينحطوا بمطرح ما في بالمرفأ إنشاءات تقدر تستوعب هيك بضاعة ما عنا بالمرفأ عم بقول لهم يعني كان كتير واضح بتصور. أورور says her husband felt compelled to go above his authority to raise the alarm bell. She says he's now paying the price for speaking up. Nami Brax is being held without charge, along with other port and customs employees and security officers. Nami is being held without charge, along with other port and customs employees and security officers. Weeks before the explosion, the now caretaker Prime Minister Hassan Dieb and the incumbent President Michel Aoun acknowledged receiving a letter from state security warning about the presence of ammonium nitrate. They said they referred the case to the relevant authorities. The state security report, dated July 20, 2020, says there was negligence on the part of the port authorities and various state administrations in securing the warehouse so that the ammonium nitrate won't be stolen or catch fire. It also mentions a 2016 correspondence between the Army Command and the Customs Directorate, in which the Army Command suggested offering the ammonium nitrate to a local explosives company or sending it back to the country of origin. 
It was signed by the commander at the time, Jean Ahwaji, who is among a number of suspects who could face criminal charges. Unfortunately, uh, the army did not take any measures, not in, uh, in you know, containing them and not in taking any measures and, uh, you know, re-exporting them. That's the law, the 137 munition law that states that these explosives, the army is responsible for them. Ashraf Safiuddin is a lawyer who specializes in export compliance. He has analyzed scores of documents and explains why he believes the shipment was not legal from the start. These explosives or the nitrate ammonium, they need a lot of administrative process before thinking of importing them. There's a process by law that should be done before entering them. And what's included in this process is the responsibility of the army, the Lebanese army. It's included in this process. So when they entered, they did not get the approval of the army. They just, you know, a judge took a decision and unloaded the product inside Lebanon. To find out how the ammonium nitrate ended up inside Warehouse 12, a team of investigative journalists has been digging deeper into its origins. What they discovered is that the shipment involved a network of shadow actors who they say used secretive companies and took advantage of lax government oversight and the weaknesses in the maritime shipping industry. We discovered that uh, this company uh, was uh, was registered in an address, okay, uh, that uh, usually is used to register uh, companies that act as shell companies. Firas Hatoum is an investigative journalist who has been trying to piece together the circumstances that led to the explosion, including the origins of the explosive material. It's believed to have started with a Russian vessel called Rosus, which set sail from the port of Batumi in September 2013. While docked in Greece, the crew was told to make an unscheduled stop in Beirut to take on extra cargo to be able to pay for passage through the Suez Canal. The Russian captain, Boris Prokochev, said the order came from the man he believed to be the ship's owner, Russian businessman Igor Grechuskin. We pulled together an international team of journalists um, in, in Europe and in the Middle East and just looked through public documents in registries. Uh, we found in the, in the Moldova registry that uh, the Rosas was in fact owned by a Panama cor uh, corporation um, that was ultimately owned by a businessman in Cyprus uh, and that it was being leased by uh, the Russian businessman Igor Grutushkin, uh, who had previously been named as the owner of the ship. This photo is purportedly of the Cypriot businessman, shipping magnate Sharalambos Manoli. His name has been implicated in offshore finance and money laundering activities. He has admitted that one of his companies once owned the Rosas, but that ended in June 2012. Then there's the company that organized the shipment of ammonium nitrate a UK-registered chemical trading firm called Savaro, which purchased the material from a Georgian factory. By all appearances, Savaro was acting as a shell company, which has since been deregistered. But it shares the same address as the businesses of three Syrian nationals. George Haswani and brothers Ahmad and Mudallal Khouri. They've denied links to Savaro, but all three have been under sanctions by the U.S. government for aiding the government of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. In 2015, Mudal al-Khuri was accused of serving as an intermediary for Assad's government for attempting to procure ammonium nitrate in late 2013. That was when the ship in question, with the chemicals on board, arrived in Beirut. Firas Hatoum says he has information that links the owner of the Rosas, the three Syrian nationals, and the Cypriot bank. That bank was called FBME, which was Lebanese-owned and based in Cyprus. 
So we had the owner of the ship and the senior businessman uh, uh, acting or uh, clients of the same bank, which is, by the way, a closed bank. I mean, it's not a bank that you can come in and like ask for a, uh, to open an account or to take a loan or to take a check, uh, a book of checks or something. No, it's just a closed bank. They choose their clients. In 2014, the U.S. Treasury Department sanctioned the bank for alleged money laundering and financing terrorists, including the Iranian-backed Lebanese armed group Hezbollah, and facilitating the purchase of chemical weapons for the Syrian government. It went out of business not long after. FBME is a very notorious bank. Um, and has been connected to multiple you know, corruption, smuggling, sanctions-busting cases around the world. Um, it's something that bears further investigation. When the ship docked in Beirut port in November 2013, it wasn't able to load heavy cargo because the ship was in a state of disrepair. There was a lengthy legal dispute over port fees and debts, which meant the captain and three crew were held there for nearly a year. That was until the Beirut authorities impounded the ship in 2014. The captain and his crew were allowed to leave. The details surrounding the ship's true destination still remain a big question. It wasn't until the port explosion that journalists discovered shipping records, which indicated the ammonium nitrate was supposed to be delivered to an explosives company in Mozambique. But it never arrived, because the Rosas was stuck in Beirut. When the company was contacted, it confirmed it ordered the chemicals from Savaro, but because it was stuck in Beirut, that was the end of the transaction. Not everyone buys this. Let's be professional. It was not intended for Mozambique. That's my, that's my uh, view of this shipment. Why? Because these are international laws. Even if you want to send these, uh, pro uh, this product to Mozambique, there are lots of administrative processes that didn't happen. You don't have only a bill of lading saying that this shipment is going to Mozambique. It's not enough for this type of shipment to go ahead. Another question journalists are trying to answer is exactly how much of the chemical compound was inside Warehouse 12 at the time of the blast. Government documents and officials say 2,750 tons were offloaded from the ship and stored in that hangar. When the ship was, uh, was unloaded, uh, there was a document uh, that said that uh, out of the 2,750 bags that were unloaded, uh, uh, 1,950 bags, which is around 2,000 uh, bags, were damaged and they uh, could not be used anymore. Uh, plus, actually, we talked to uh, several people who witnessed uh, uh, the whole process. One of them was the, the driver of the crane who unloaded the ship. Uh, one of them was the owner of the uh, company that was hired by the port authorities to unload the ship. They doubt that uh, the amount that was removed from the ship was uh, 2,750. They said they believe it was a, a much uh, less amount, uh, okay? And uh, the one, one of the guys who signed the document that said 1,950 bags were damaged, he, uh, he, said, he said it clearly that he did not count. He just signed a paper. This is not unusual, given that many state institutions are riddled with corruption. The way the port operates leaves room for security lapses and theft. More often than not, the equipment used to scan cargo doesn't work. In Beirut, there are five different departments. We have the government, the government, the the كل واحد عنده مهمة لكن ما في جهاز واحد ينسي الأعمال انعدام هذا التنسيق أدى إلى دخول النترات وبقاء كل هاي المدة هايدي وحصول الانفجار There is little audit and oversight Proper inventories are rarely conducted I believe those 2,000 tons 1,000 actually 950 tons they were removed from the ship before it was uh, unloaded. Uh, the missing amount was, uh, was removed in, in one way or, or another from the ship, in an illegal way, of course. 
What many experts have said is the size of the blast indicates that the amount of 2,750 tons did not explode. The U.S. Domestic Intelligence Agency, the FBI, and French forensic teams provided some technical assistance in the investigation. And even though their findings have not been made public, it's believed the FBI concluded the amount that exploded is 500 tons. The evidence available so far does point to incompetence, bureaucratic ineptitude, and endemic corruption. The perfect groundwork for what some call a man-made national catastrophe. With a disaster like this, it's very tempting to look for a, a neat and simple solution, that this was all um, a big conspiracy and that everything, and that this was a criminal effort to, to smuggle um, ammonium nitrate to Syria. On the evidence we have right now, we can't conclude something like that. What we do see was that they, there was the use of a lot of um, very typical uh, tricks that are used to hide ownership and to make things complex and bury them underneath. Behind this might be um, criminality, it might also be incompetence, um, and more likely it's a mix um, of the two. In a country where there has been a culture of impunity, the battle for justice has rarely been won. ولازم مش انه بس يتحاسبوا اكثر لازم ينشنقوا لانه عنده عندي ضحايا when the blast happened lebanon was already a broken country a state close to collapse after decades of corruption and mismanagement by a political class still in power it's that corrupt system that many blame for the failure to respond to the threat i'm looking forward to know for whom this nitrate came, who kept this nitrate in Lebanon, who allowed this nitrate to enter Lebanon, who knew about it and kept these nitrates here. I mean, we, we want a, a whole complete justice. We don't want partial justice. The victims were not only Lebanese. Their portraits in one of Beirut's busiest intersections are a reminder that justice has yet to be served. Their lives cut short by the worst peacetime disaster in a country with a turbulent and dark past, where the truth has often been the victim.